What's up, everybody? Welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. But first, I gotta say that Diamond didn't get our shipment to us in time. Obviously, they had some problems with their website over the weekend. I think that a, a lot of shops are gonna have their Diamond shipment delayed. So I had to check out some things digitally, and I was unable to check out other things, such, such as May's book, and uh, No One Left to Fight, Volume 2, Issue Number 2, both of those from Dark Horse Comics, and Kanto. Those are ones I was planning on reading, wasn't able to check out, but you can definitely check out my thoughts on those next week, hopefully, on the weekly comic book review. And I do want to highlight DynamicForces.com real quick. Check out their website. They got great limited edition covers, CGC books, signed books, remarks, amazing content over at DynamicForces.com. And be sure to enter Robbie at your cart and save 10%. And now it's time for the weekly comic book review. And we always start with the pick of the week. And this week's pick of the week, what's the furthest place from here, issue number one, from Matt Rosenberg, from Tyler Boss, and from Hassan Otsman El Hal, I really liked this book. There is a sophistication in the technique that is used in this book, from the writing to the artwork to the layouts, the composition to the lettering, everything about it works so well together. So it's reminding me, of course, of Four Kids Walk Into a Bank, also by Rosenberg and Boss, but this is a definitely a different book with a different feel and a different vibe. It's heavily influenced by music, but it's done so in a very subtle and real way that I really appreciate it. This is a story about like survivors at the end of the world. And so far it's all just kids, right? And they all have formed up these different gangs. They all have their territory, things like that. And what we mostly get in this first issue is some really excellent character work. Introducing those characters, throwing some of the concepts in. It's a little bit obscure at times with what exactly is going on with the world in this story, but it's those characters that ingrain us in. The artwork is top notch. It is absolutely phenomenal. The lettering is amazing. I really like this. There are limited editions that come with like a pressed record that you can like have, a, they have a couple songs on them. There's gonna be one of those for each one. I really like the book. I thought it was a cool experiment into kind of blending a little bit more to, of music and comics and, their, and, their, and how it works together, but it's really a story about these kids introducing them and basically what happens is they don't know what's on outside of their neighborhood and one of them goes missing and then it kind of sets this series of events into motion where they're going to have to go out now and find out what has happened. So we will discover what's going on as well as the characters. The characters, the artwork, the, the, the technique was masterful. It was the pick of the week. It was amazing. Also from Image Comics, because that book's from Image Comics, I read Phenomix. Issue number one. This is the John Leguizamo superhero book. Um, I was rather excited to read this. I wasn't expecting much out of it. It doesn't deliver much, but it delivered exactly what I thought it would. Um, very cheesy, over the top, um, kind of dumb. It's not really good. It's not a good book, but for some reason I enjoyed it. It felt like John Leguizamo developing a superhero property for like the 90s. It feels like a 90s comic book movie. And like not in a good way, but it was kind of fun. But I'm telling you, I won't recommend it. But I had a lot of fun with it. It's John Leguizamo as superhero. And he's cracking jokes. Like you could totally see how it's written for John Leguizamo. Like, and, and John was like, <clears throat> you know, created the story. It's his creation. But like there's three other writers. So there's a lot of cooks in that kitchen. It's clunky. It's all over the place. But it's just so random. I guess they were like, you know, Keanu Reeves is doing a comic book and he's in the comic book and they're going to do like a show or something. And John Leguizamo was like, hey, I got an idea. It was something. It was an idea. Six Sidekicks of Trigger Keaton issue number six is here. This is the final issue of the first volume. 
And I hope to get more of this book. It was amazing. This is a really great finale. Um, this book has been fun, quirky, incredibly humorous, and it's had action, right? It doesn't take itself too seriously. Trigger Keaton is a famous uh, like television actor, stuntman, something like that. He's always on these shows with these different sidekicks, and he treats everybody like complete crap, right? And he's just not a good dude. Well, in the first issue, he comes up dead, and nobody but his six former sidekicks of his shows, who have every reason to hate him, they're the only ones that care enough to actually band together and try to solve the murder. They solve the murder here. Like I said, it's incredibly funny, it's quirky, it's out there, and I loved this conclusion. Undiscovered Country number 17. This book is starting to lose me. What happens is towards the end of each arc, I start my interest starts waning so heavily on this book by uh, Scott Snyder, Charles Soule, um, and uh, is it Common Cully? I don't, I don't have it in front of me. Um, but man, like it starts losing me at the end of each arc. And then I get excited about the promise of a new arc because that means they're going to go into a new section of this mysterious America that's been closed off for, for, for in their time, like hundreds of years, right? So the book is just dragging on. It's not really capturing me. It's not doing anything exciting with character work. It's it's doing interesting things with the mythology of America and kind of, you know, playing that out in the long term. And it's got cool ideas and concepts, but it's really starting to lose me again. But as we're nearing the arc, there's one more issue for this arc. And then we're on to the next one. And I'm going to be excited again because I just want to know what the next idea is. Anyway. That being said, Righteous Thirst for Vengeance, issue number two, was super solid. Um, Rick Remender, Andre uh, Lima Arajo, I, I, I like the book. It doesn't really clearly try to tell you what's going on. Like, you have to kind of work for it. You have to kind of piece it together. This is something that's told way more visually than it is with words or a narrative or anything like that. Um, I'm still trying to piece it together, but the artwork is amazing. Garajo's artwork has always astounded me ever since I first saw the cat on Generation Gone. By the way, if you've never checked out that Silver Surfer special or annual or something that he did, the artwork in that is fantastic. But there's a lot of intricate texture and detail, but the, the, the panels, the pages, they don't feel crowded. It's got a lot of detail, but there's a lot of room to breathe in it. And I love the backgrounds. I love the figure work. I love the, the pacing of it, the sequential storytelling. It is a tour de four as far as how to tell a story with, with art, right? Story-wise, it's it still feels rather thin, but the way that they can impactfully tell this story by using mostly images Really astounds me. I thought that was pretty solid. Stillwater issue number 11. This is kicking off the next arc. I believe this is the start of the second arc. Anyway, it, maybe it's not. Maybe there's like two more. It doesn't matter. What's happening is we're picking up a year after the events of the last issue. There was some craziness that's going on. Stillwater's this town. Um, it's a mysterious town. And if you're in the boundaries of the town, you can't die. And you don't grow old. But all these kids have kind of revolted. And now they've kind of like taken over, so we're a little bit like Lord of the Flies, Children of the Corn, almost just a little bit. So we're seeing things from a different perspective. Some of these, some of these heroes and villains that we've been built up for with uh, ten issues of knowing who they are, like you're you're seeing them in a different light because they're trying to like tiptoe around like the wills of the children, the will of the children. It's a really cool book, and I'm liking it. Still having fun with it, and there's some nice twisty type stuff here that I thought was. Really rather rad. Let's jump over to Boom Studios, where I read uh, Regarding the Matter of Oswald's Body, issue number one. I think this is Christopher Cantwell. Um, Castle and Guida, I believe, is the artist who was all of the artists on Lost Soldiers, for instance, and Scout's Honor. I think it's the same person, but it's not in front of me. Um, the book, it was okay. It was interesting. So it's about Lee Harvey Oswald, and is it really his body? It's about that JFK assassination, but before the assassination, there's this dude who's representing some government agency who's finding all these different people with these skills to put together a team to do something involving Lee Harvey Oswald. And this is like before the assassination, so it's it's going to dive into that, I guess, the conspiracy of what happened at the assassination of JFK and Oswald's body, but it's just in this issue introducing us the in the in like the slightest way possible to that concept but mostly introducing the team it's set up kind of like a like a heist movie where he's going and he's finding each person so you're 
everybody and their task and their purpose is clearly defined to you as a reader. So it was a decent enough first issue. Didn't really have a super crazy hook that brought me in, but there was something about it that that flowed very well for me. Mighty Morphin issue number 13. This is starting the Iltarian War. Yeah, we've had 24 issues of Mighty Morphin and of Power Rangers building up to this. We're diving more into the secret origin of Zordon and Zed, and now the, the Altarians, they're like, they're out there, they're here, and, and spoilers, but what's been built up to is that Zordon's people, who we thought should be the good guys, are actually the bad guys. Zed used to be one of them, and so all these different pieces are moving around. It's big, it's exciting. I'm having a lot of fun with this book. It's reignited my interest in it. It's uh, causing much excitement. I think it's a really solid superhero book. Mamo, issue number five from Boom Studios. This wraps up this tale. It's kind of about a witch who's trapped in this town because of the machinations of her grandmother, who was also a witch. The town has to have a witch. It's bound to that land or whatever. But this, this witch, she wants to leave. She wants to find herself. It's a book about identity. It's a book about discovery. And it's a book about redemption and it's a book about hope and promises right and so i really liked this book i thought it had a very satisfying conclusion it's a really great kind of like young adult and almost not quite all ages but nearish that but it's it's it doesn't shy away from the darkness of of the human experience but it does so in a very delicate great way manga-esque and the artwork has been amazing so i really liked mamo um jumping over to aftershock my date with monsters issue number one this one's by paul tobin um, and it's an interesting concept. It's, there's the government tried to weaponize nightmares, like pulling nightmares out of people's dreams and, and being able to weaponize them as like soldiers in war or something like that. Um, it backfired and they've opened up this portal basically. So like everybody now has to like take these pills that causes you not to dream because if you dream, these nightmares are going to come out. And so this is a woman who has, uh, like a, a nightmare that follows her around is kind of like her buddy who eats other nightmares. So she's trying to put a stop to things. Her daughter is very central to the mystery. So it was a cool concept, interesting enough characters. The artwork was by Andy McDonald. I really appreciated that. However, the execution of the story does get a bit clunky. It gets overly verbose at times and kind of bogs down the pace of the story. And it feels like a rather long and arduous read at times. But there was some saving grace, meaning like that story really is an interesting idea. And the way that that kind of developed was cool. It could have just been done in a more flowy type way, I think. Chicken Devil issue number two. Um, I don't remember the writer, Brian Bucciolato, I think. Um, Hayden Sherman on the artwork. <clears throat> you know I'm a big fan of Hayden Sherman, artist of Wasted Space. Uh, Mary Shelley Monster Hunter, The Few, Thumbs. You know, a lot of people talking about thumbs all of a sudden. I've been talking about thumbs. It's a good book. Um, like the artwork here, it's about this dude who runs this successful chain of hot chicken restaurants or whatever, and his business partner uh, stole, like, a gang's heroin. And then the dude, like, they had some retaliation, and now this guy's, like, stuck with in, in this mess because of his business partner. It's called Chicken Devil. There's this, like, chicken costume that he wears to hide his identity. It's, it's, it's weird. It's about a man way in over his head with nothing to lose, and I think it could wind up being a rather cool book. It's just not quite super grabbing me through the story. There's just something about it that's not clicking, but the artwork is fantastic. From Dynamite Entertainment, we got Vampirilla issue number 25. I haven't been reading Vampirilla, so I took a look at this one because this is the big finale of the wedding of Vampirilla and Dracula or something like that. So I kind of breezed through it. It looked interesting. I haven't been keeping up with it, and, and you don't want to start a Christopher Priest book on the like the 25th issue trust me and this is also leading into the upcoming vampirella dracula unholy war or whatever book coming in i wanted to get in on that so i guess definitely got to get caught up on vampirella james bond's Hymeros issue number two i like this so much more than issue number one i thought issue number one was a decent james bond story it's rodney barnes if i believe if my memory is correct, and Antonio Fuso on the artwork. So I like the artwork. It's got this great sense of action flow. It's about this dude who has an island, and he's dead now, and Bond has to, like, take his, like, assistant or something and protect her, but she might be, like, the villain as well. And and it's just a really great issue. It was action-packed. It, it gave out the little bits of the story necessary when it was needed, and, and it had a nice flow to it. I really liked the artwork, so that was really cool. Kiss Phantom Obsession, issue number three. 
Um, this is just a silly book. Basically, this rich guy has hired Kiss to perform a private concert for him, but it's all just a ploy to somehow leech and siphon off their energy and create his own something. Um, still a bit unclear, but he's got this 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 resort or this island that he's got, and it's just filled with all these movie references. And in this one, it's Kiss with these powers fighting kaiju. Like Godzilla, there's like a King Kongish type thing. Like, it's... It's silly and it's fun and it's just, I mean, that's what it is. It's goofy, it's silly, and it's fun. And I had a lot of fun with it. Nyx, number one. This is a new one from Dynamite. Nyx apparently is a villain of Vampirella. Like, I'm not super familiar. So I decided I wanted to check this out. It has some really nice covers attached to it. And what it is, is Nyx is like half demon, half human. Um, but not really half demon. It's like the god of chaos, um, like, had a child with an earth woman. And Nyx is the result. So she got these, like hellfire chaos powers or something like that she's just trying to live a normal life she doesn't want any attachment to her father or the rain and hell or any of this other world the stuff that's going on she's just out there trying to like basically enjoy the pleasures of being human you know food sex things like that right so as that happens she starts developing feelings for one starts catching them and then that old life starts rearing his head back in. I really liked the book. The artwork felt a bit stiff at times, but other times it really shined. Um, so overall, I thought that was cool. That's what I read digitally. Let's go to the physical world. And from Marvel, we have Venom number one. Finally here, the long-awaited debut of Rom V and Al Ewing and Brian Hitch on the pages of Venom. Or should I say, in the pages of Venom. But here is the cover. I liked the book. I thought it was solid. It was... Not as wowy, not as game changey as, say, Donny Cates' first issue was. Like, when Cates and Stegman came in, that was like a, that felt like a gear shift in this character's journey. This feels like more of a continuation, uh, obviously picking up from the end of King and Black, the ramifications on that. There are, like, two sides of this story. There's a side about Dylan Brock, and it's more an Earth-based story about a kid who's kind of, like, angry all the time and trying to find his new way in this in this new world of his and then you've got eddie doing this really crazy cosmic king in black kind of thing where he's just traveling from symbiote to symbiote and then he uncovers this intense mystery and threat from the future they do some really interesting things with venom's powers here um the idea is that al ewing's doing more of the cosmic side of things and that Ron B's doing more of the earth-based Dylan side of things but both of them felt like one story it felt cohesive it didn't feel inconsistent or like you know jarring or anything like that it actually worked and flowed very well together Brian Hitch's artwork was super strong like super strong this dude was like decent at first got really solid during like the authority and the planetary or not planetary but the authority and the ultimates days and then kind of weakened out a little bit and then has gotten super strong again like lately like his hawkman work was fantastic his just league work as far as penciling was pretty decent at times too um but venom the artwork was super solid i liked the story it didn't completely wow me but by the end of it i was really excited to see where this is going to go i think aram v and al ewing together have made an interesting cool follow-up to the conclusion of the donny case ryan stegman and family run. Anyway, we also got a Thing miniseries, The Thing, number one, next big thing, part one. Um, This one was okay. It starts off rather strong. First of all, the artwork by Tom Riley is absolutely amazing. It says it's a tale set back in the day, but Ben and Alicia are engaged, so there's that. So it's not too far back in the day, but at times they're acting like it's further. It doesn't matter. So the Thing is home alone or something like that, and he winds up with this curse or something. To be honest, man, the story didn't do much for me. Like I said, it started off really strong, and then it started losing me. It just kind of made these weird leap in the story, and the structure just didn't quite work for me, and it just kind of felt all over the place at times, and it wasn't clear, right? But the artwork was really cool. It's very simple style, and at times where it needs to be, it gets rather creepy, and it was really nice. I like the artwork and the, I mean, the coloring too. Jordi Belair's artwork on the coloring was absolutely amazing. That was one of Marvel's best colored titles that I read this week. I'll just say that. Amazing Spider-Man issue 78 is here and it's losing me. I am, I am, I I was reading this. I, I didn't care. It's picking up from the end of the last issue where Morbius is biting Ben Riley. Ben Riley is Spider-Man now working for the Beyond Corporation. They've got Misty Knight and Colleen Wing working for them, but they're doing something nefarious, of course, behind the scenes. Peter Parker's, like, in a coma. 
And it's just not exciting. I just don't care. It just doesn't feel like it's got stakes. And even though it's setting up things that should have high stakes, it still just feels like it's filler. And, and it's losing me quickly. The cover, though, that's that's dope. That's pretty. That's Art Adams, right? Pretty sure that's an Art Adams cover. That's dope. Strange Academy is back with issue number 13. Um, this is a really solid book, kicking off the second year of Strange Academy in, in a really big, fun way. Um, the characters in here. So they're all, like, connected to all these different corners of the Marvel Universe. They're all magical beings. They, they study under the Strange Academy. It's kind of like... It's kind of like Hogwarts for the Marvel Universe, right? And they just wrapped up this big story, right, with issue 12. And now, picking up from the pieces left there, they're crafting the natural progression and evolution that I have had so much fun with this series. Humberto Ramos has done every single freaking page, and it's been some of the best work of his career. This one is solid. Scotty Young, Humberto Ramos, Edgar, Edgar. Delgado, you know we love some Strange Academy. Savage Avengers is here with issue number 27. This is a story that does feel like it's been going on too long, but now the payoff is here. We finally have the Savage Avengers, all of them. They all show up in this issue. That's cool. Like everybody that's been in all these books kind of show up for this final battle with Gullen Goth, Cullen Goth. And it doesn't quite go how you think it's going to go. The book is fun. I like Patch Zercher's artwork. Um, I've been liking the story, but it is time for this to kind of wrap the story up because it's been going on for a while with not really a lot of meat to the buildup. You know what I'm saying? But the artwork was cool, and I really like the ending and the setup for the next issue, which promises to be the conclusion of that whole giant story they've been doing. Hellions is here with issue number 17, the penultimate issue of Hellions. Um, this has been one of the only X-Books that I really like. I always say that. I always say that I'm done with the X-Books, but I'm loving the X-Men books still. Like, all four issues. Four had some... I had some issues with four, but aside from that, like, I am liking X-Men right now. Okay. But Hellions is one I've been liking, and now that we're nearing the end, the team's coming together, they're kind of forming this bond, and that's cool to see. There's some big moments here, but at the same time, it's like... I'm just reading this until the end. I'm like, there's I'm, the only reason why I'm still on this book is because it's, it's wrapping up at issue 18. So like, why not just stick it out? Because it has been a fun book. The fun aspect of it has gone away. It's gotten a little bit more serious, but it's it's kind of working as for the the big build up to the final climatic battle and, and the the coming together of this team. And there will be casualties. It doesn't matter. It's it's Krakoa. Hellions number 17. <clears throat> Pretty solid. Alien is here with issue number eight. Um, this one, I like this arc better than the last arc, for sure. The last arc was about that military dude trying to go save his son or whatever. Um, this one is about, like, the the, the corporation, like, sending <laughs> in, in a supply drop for this, like, this, um, this world that's out there. They just terraform. These people are out there. They're, like, part of this religious sect. And, and they have an agreement that they'll take care of the world, they'll be supplied for, and it will be their land. Um, but the corporation, the Watani Corporation, of course, they, they don't want that. You know what I'm saying? You don't want that. So they send some aliens after them. And, and so now <clears throat> it kind of feels like the setup for like a classic alien story or a movie or a book or something where you got this place and then it's now they're going to start being infested with aliens and just kind of get to hear, fit, hit all those familiar beats yet again. But it's all right. The artwork, though... It's not that Salvador La Roca is, is bothering me in this one. I think he's doing fine. The way he draws the aliens are great, but I'm not liking the coloring here. It is way too murky. There's not enough contrast. And I get what you're trying to do by showing the atmosphere of the planet, but it's just way too... It's just... It's it's not really poppy because of it. So I, I had a problem with the artwork, but over, other than that, it's been a solid story. It's been a solid story. Um, over at DC, we got Robin and Batman issue number one. First of three prestige issues... Um, I loved this book. This may be my favorite DC book this week. There were some good ones, but Robin and Batman is once again telling us the origin of Robin. Not that, like, the death of his parents or anything like that, but how he makes the transition from training to being Robin. It's a story we've seen done many times before in many great ways. Think of Batman the Gauntlet by Lee Weeks. That was absolutely astonishing. Think about Batman, or think about Robin year one. Things like that, right? Dark Victory. This is doing it not in a necessarily different way, but a very, very resonating type way. Why? It's because Jeff Lemire and Dustin Wen, come on, it's the team of Ascender, the team of Descender. It's Jeff Lemire doing what he can do best, bringing that kind of like melancholy, bittersweetness in some of his more personal um, creator-owned work, 
bringing a little bit of that into the character Dick Grayson and making a very well-rounded young kid who is also not a kid because of everything he's gone through and what he's what he's training to become and the nuance and the dynamic between the relationship of Alfred, Bruce, and Dick is absolutely amazing. The artwork is solid. Robin and Batman, number one. That was worth it. Super cool. Then we got Batman the Imposter, issue number two. Um, this one's written by Mattson Tomlin, who's one of the screenwriters of the upcoming Batman movie uh, with uh, with an uh, old dude from Twilight. What's his name? Pattinson? Robert Pattinson? Um, Andrea Sorrentino, Jordi Belair on the artwork. So you know the artwork's going to be amazing, and it was. And I liked it. So in the last issue, I really liked kind of the focus on the psychological damage that's going on with Bruce. This is early in Bruce's career. This is completely separate out of continuity. And in the first issue, it felt very much like we were getting into the headspace of what the Batman was going to be like in this upcoming movie. In this one, it not only veers away from seemingly so that movie, but it also veers far away from established, typical DC continuity and lore. So it starts playing with things. What if we move this piece out, what would happen to Bruce then? So that was really interesting. I like the artwork. It didn't quite sell me as much as issue number one, but I did like it. Um, basically what's going on in the story is that the 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 one percent of Gotham are tired of Batman getting in their way, so they've hired somebody to impersonate Batman, and he's killing people. And now he's on this mission. Uh, Leslie Tompkins is in there. There's a lot of focus on her. Great panel composition and design and layout is really solid. So I thought it was good yet again. Like seriously, Action Comics is here with 1,036, and my big problem with the whole Superman of the Authority is now like actually the lead in into here is that obviously that was not meant to be a part of this continuity and it's like they don't even care at least in this issue philip kennedy johnson tries to like be like oh this is why it doesn't oh this is he tries to explain some things and it it works enough it works enough because this book is awesome this is the beginning of the warlord saga or the war world saga i should say um, we've been building up to this. Superman's there. He's wanting to free everybody. He's got his new his new crew, the, this new version of the Authority. Um, Apollo and Midnight are there, and these new versions of other characters like Steel and uh, Manchester Black, of course, and Omac and whatnot. Bruh, let me tell y'all something. This book was big. It was epic. And when Superman gets there, they don't they don't quite. It gets hard, freaking core. This is great, grandiose sci-fi, fantasy, epic type stuff in Superman, and I'm loving it. I am loving it. This this was awesome, and the artwork by Daniel Semperi, freaking just awesome. Okay, that's all I can say. Justice League Last Ride issue number seven. This was, of course, the last ride of the last ride because it's the last issue. Um, I was upset that Vin Diesel didn't show up. However, the book did have a very satisfying conclusion. And also, surprisingly, it sets up what could be another series down the road. Chip Zdarsky, the way he explored the relationships with these characters, this is a Justice League that had been disbanded, had been broken up, um, their relationships completely shattered. And in this one, as well as having this big, bombastic, dark side plot and story, you also have Lobo in there. And the way that Chip Zdarsky was able to kind of personalize the story with these like godlike mythical figures and make them very real and, and, and really get to spend some time in, in those relationships <clears throat> and build that up and, and, and kind of strip down and, and speak on what actually makes it work and what makes that important in the midst of having great bombastic comic book action is a great uh, great finale to the to a pretty solid series absolutely deathstroke issue two is here deathstroke inc issue number two i should say this is by joshua williamson howard porter I believe this came out last week to most shots but i didn't get it until this week um i'm loving it this book is just fun it's deathstroke he's working for this organization along with black canary and the new version of the toy man and they're working for this organization called Trust, but like obviously you can't trust a company called Trust because that's just how it's going to go. They get sent in this issue after a, a satellite that's being like taken over by these terrorists or something, and it's just a really fun, bombastic comic book. This one has like nothing but double page spreads, high octane energy and action, and it's not like super serious into the character of Slade Wilson or or any kind of dynamic like that, but it is just a real fun exciting, exhilarating comic book experience. The colors pop, the layouts are amazing, and it's just, it tells a nice, solid, one-and-done story in the midst of an overall narrative, and it continues to build. I like that. Joshua Williamson, dude's got a future in this industry. The Joker is here with issue number nine, and I can fully say that I am 
lost on this book. Not that I don't know what's going on, because there's some interesting ideas. James Tynan's doing his best, Scott Snyder, and tying up the idea that there's this conspiracy going on that's tying all the way back to the creation of Bane and Joker's somehow involved in it, and all this stuff's been connected. And it's an interesting enough concept, but the book is just getting dull and boring. Not a lot is happening, and even in issues like this where a lot does seemingly happen, it doesn't feel exciting. This one doesn't have Gillian March on the artwork. That kind of hurt it. But I like the focus on Gordon, but they're not telling us anything new about Gordon. Joker's not really much in here. Sometimes in the earliest days of this book, like the first four issues, I thought were very, very strong. We have way went beyond that for me, and it is losing me, and I'm losing interest very quickly in this Joker book. Now we only have, I don't know, like what, six, seven, eight, eight something like that more issues left from Tynan, but... It's really losing me. Also losing me is Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman 781. I think I might be done with this book after this. I stuck it through. At times the book is pretty solid and it's decent and it's consistent, but then at other times it's not. It can go all over the place. At the drop of a hat, it will be like really solid, like four issues, and then just get weird and kind of weird and like feel like it's like directionless for a moment, and then pull it right back in. It lets stories breathe and go about too long. And it doesn't get to the point quick enough sometimes, and that's kind of bothering me. So Wonder Woman's back and... They're, they spent some weird time in this book and in this issue, too. Like, they're not quite... Like, she's, like, hiding away from Steve uh, Steve Rogers. From, from Steve Trevor. And, uh, and it might as well be Steve Rogers, right? But anyway, Wonder Woman 781, it's all right. It's all right. I mean, there's some decent stuff, but what's going on in these Wonder Woman books? The artwork's okay in here, and it goes back to the Dead Man stuff. The coloring is really good, Tamara Bond villain. But the story, what the journey of the character right now is just not working for me. I didn't like that Nubia book, and I'm just not excited that everything's building up to this trial of the Amazons. It just feels like it's just going to be a chore to keep up with that. Black Manta, not good. DC does have some good books. They also have some, some real stinkers this week. Black Manta, number three. Why is this book here? It doesn't work for me. The artwork was is solid enough at times, but then in issue three, you start realizing why this dude probably shouldn't be doing, like, like something that's trying to be an explosive superhero book. I don't know. They're building up to this Aquaman thing. I think the Aquaman, the becoming, is pretty decent enough right now, but Black Mana has never gripped me, never grabbed me. I don't even understand. You, and not, you understand what's going on in the story, and I get it, but at the same time, it's just, I don't know. I don't know. It's just not working for me. Batman Urban Legend issue number nine. Didn't like anything in here except for the Dan Waters Azrael story. I did like that bit, but the conclusion of the Alyssa Wong Batwoman story, I thought just didn't work, and I just it just didn't work for me. The Outsiders bit is just, it was that was hard to get through. Um, but I did like the Dan Waters story. What was the other story? There's a Tweedledee, Tweedledum story in there that's decent enough, but really on the nose, I guess. And then Superman versus Lobo. Um, issue number two from uh, Tim Seeley, uh, Sarah Beatty, and uh, Mirka Indolfo. It's been a while since issue number one. I almost didn't couldn't remember what had happened in issue number one, but I got caught up re very quickly in the first few pages of here. What's happened is this entity has come around. He's trying to reward Superman and Lobo for some reason. And so he recreates Krypton, and he recreates uh, Lobo's home world, but he mistakenly put Superman on Lobo's world and Lobo on Superman's world. So you kind of get to play around with that. It's really tongue-in-cheek. I mean, this book knows what it's trying to be, and it's not tied into continuity. Lobo's pretty funny. It is, it's quirky, it's weird, it's amusing. It's got this, like, slight raunchiness to it, but only the slight raunchiness to it, because obviously it's still a Superman book, but I did, I did have fun with it. It's not going to change your life, nothing to write home to mother about, but definitely something. So that's what I read. That's what I thought about them. What are you reading? What are you digging? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. If you want to support the channel any further, you can do so at patreon.com slash PCP. Unlock exclusive bonus content like a downloadable audio-only version of the weekly comic book review available you, well over an hour before it drops on YouTube, and the podcast does return in January, and before that audio for those podcast episodes are available, our patrons at $5 and up will have access to the live video recording of the podcast. You actually get to see us in studio doing, doing the stuff. We're actually not going to be in one place. We're going to be in a bunch of... We're doing it. Whatever. doesn't matter. So join us at patreon.com slash PCP. In support, if you want to, like Tomorrow Cinema. Manny, we really do appreciate it. You go above and beyond all the time. 
You're the best, bruh. We love you. Anyway, that's what we got for you. That's what we did. So please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Check us out over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts, blogs, and uh, not too much more. Um, I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading. Station.